Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Boardsville February 7th um, monthly meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge Thank you. Roll call of Board of Trustees, so all of my fellow trustees are present live this evening. For the good of the order, board discussion, do any board members have any comments this evening? I wanted to just say we had an advisory council since advisory council since school counseling program meeting earlier this evening. Um, and they are doing a great job. And I wanted to let the board know that the, the social worker that we approved for a full time position has been incredibly busy um, supporting the elementary school and sort of programming those schools as well. Um, and from the conversation, um, the take of the members of the committee is that the need for counseling services continues to outpace our capacity. So I'm hopeful that you know, when we're looking at the budget this year, we'll be able to find some, some more um, resources to support that program because they really are doing a great job. Thanks. Thank you, Archie. Anyone else? Hey, I was just going to say I see um, two scouts in our audience this evening, and um, I assume you're here probably on your citizenship in the community badge? Communication. Communication, okay. And, you know, I just want to acknowledge what a great feat it is and how I know how hard it's been through COVID, so hopefully you gain some good experience being here. So thank you for coming. Anyone else? Okay, so opportunity for the public to be heard. Um, what I think we're gonna do is just start with um, people who are here live because the purpose of having, um, according, and we do have a policy, a board policy 1230 that goes into much de more detail, but the board does um, very much appreciate community input. So we have always invited community members to attend the meeting to approach the board for up to three minutes to allow everyone to have a say, but to also allow us to conduct business. We did for a while when we had to um, limit the amount of people coming or not coming at all to our meetings. We did allow emails and we, web, we were looking at um, people calling in for webinars because we were limiting the amount of people at our meetings. But that is no longer the case. So we're going to go back to, unless there's any opposition from my fellow board meeting, that people will be continue to be invited to come live to our meetings, make your three minute comment that we always appreciate hearing. You can always email the board. Our, our emails are posted on our website, but we won't be reading emails throughout the board meeting. They, the ones from tonight, if we have time, we will read at the end of the meeting. The board has well read them, and they will be posted with the minutes. So we'd like to focus in now on um, anybody who would like to make comments to the board to come up here to the microphone. We will be timing, and at three minutes, we'll be following the next person up. So please be courteous to everyone so they have enough time to speak. Thank you. And state your name, please. Hi, my name is Exona. Do you want me to stand or sit? Whatever you can, what, whatever you're more if comfortable. You're sit, uh, yeah, whatever you're more comfortable. Um, hi, my name is Exona. Um, at what point after two years with what should have been two weeks to help slow the spread, do you draw the line and say enough? Are we trying to cure death or are we trying to become immortal? It concerns me that a lot of you really believe you're accomplishing and or preventing something by wearing a mask. Wearing a mask to prevent COVID is like putting up a chain link fence to stop mosquitoes from getting through, and that's actual science. What are you going to do when the mask mandate is lifted? These masks have become a security blanket for a lot of you, and it's become hard for some of you to just let go of it. I suggest picking up a hobby to get you through this when masking eventually does become optional. I'm convinced that this gives some of you for the first time in your life a sense of purpose. You feel like you're here saving lives when in actuality you're doing more harm than good. Those who will pay the ultimate price will be our children. 
The biggest mistake parents are making is assuming that children are resilient. Have you thought about the mental and emotional damage you're causing our children? You're creating a future for children that will consist of mental illnesses. They're going to grow up as young adults with anxiety, panic attack, OCD, paranoia, germaphobes, etc. You're teaching your children that someone's health is more important, um, is more valuable than their own. Some children cannot breathe with a mask on. They hyperventilate, sweat, have seizures, develop bacterial infections and strep, which my daughter had the same strep culture three times in a row and she's never had it until she came to school and had to be forced to wear masks all day. Children should be taught to put themselves first. Self-love is not selfish. As we all know, no one can pour from an empty cup. We are draining our kids mentally, emotionally, and physically. This is teaching our children to be afraid of the invisible boogeyman. At this point in this pandemic, I do not care about your grandma or your feelings. It's not the responsibility of our children to have the weight of the world put on their shoulders. You do what's best for you, I'll do what's best for me. This needs to end, we're all over it. I have a 42 page document that I emailed to everyone. I know somebody, a couple of you had issues opening. I have it with me um, that show the side effects of wearing masks every day. On January 25th, you endangered the welfare of my child as well as every child that attended Voorheesville Central School District. And when questioned about it, not one email was returned and I sent multiple emails out. It's one thing to play games with me. It's another thing to play games with my daughter. And you may have won that battle, but believe me when I say you will never win this war. Crimes against humanity, it's not gonna look great on your part. Trust me when I say I will not go away. This is just the beginning, Godspeed. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, and that's the, well, thank you for your comments. Would anyone else like to make a public comment? How are we doing today? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Aaron Minnick. I have uh, two boys in elementary school, one in kindergarten, and I have another in um, second grade, and then I have uh, one more that's going to be coming through the lens here in a few in a few years. So I had an uh, interesting conversation with um, our superintendent this week. Um, that uh, due to one of my sons, he had COVID and wasn't allowed back in school. But come to find out, the nurse didn't know the rules, um, which is hence is why I'm here. Um, so I really feel as a school board, if, if this court case goes the way that it should go, it's going to come back on the school board of what we're going to do about masking and ma mandating vaccines. We've already seen the vaccine mandates have been turned down by every Supreme Court. And why would we enforce it on young children when most countries don't apply this to kids? At their age groups, but yeah, we force it for our kids to play basketball as we were. And that was the last time you saw me before CYO. The learning has been diminished, and we have to re educate adults now on what the true risk of this disease is. As I look at the board, we're all sitting here wearing masks. I can probably guarantee all of you have had three vaccines in you, and you're still wearing masks. At what point is enough enough? At what point are you going to be okay taking these off? My sister works for a school district, same size as mine. She's in the lunchroom in a different state, and just because it's run by a different um, political party, they don't have mandates. They haven't had a mandate since October of 2020. When I tell her what we're doing here, masking two-year-old kids, she laughs and says, I haven't seen a mask since I left your state in October of 2020. Um, do, why don't we look at data from those states? And I get it, this isn't on you guys. Once the state rules, it will come back to the school board. So my son was out with COVID. My whole family had COVID. No one had symptoms except me. Um, he was out the week before because he had the sniffles and he did not want to go to school because the mask with the mask on, he did not want to have the sniffles with the mask. Um, my son Lucas, who was in kindergarten, three years ago in 2018, he was hospitalized with the flu. Not one person when I tell them that has ever said to me, oh my God, I'm glad he survived. I tell them that my kids had COVID and then I get ridiculed because they don't vaccinate my children for this. Um, it's just because it's emergency use and we shouldn't be forcing this on anybody at this given stage. But everyone's like, oh my God, I see that guy. Uh, he did not have one symptom and they were fist fighting as soon as they found out they were positive with costumes on fighting in their house. Mind you, I get that might not be the case for every kid, but again, I don't know any kids that have been hospitalized with this. I don't want to ever see anyone hospitalized with this, but the odds of that happening are very slim and I'm not going to go over data with you guys because I'm sure you do. 
World Health Organization does not advise masking young children. They do not advise boosting young children. They don't advise vaccinating young children. Um, and that's the World Health Organization that I'm sure most people, if you're Democratic, complained when um, our former president pulled out of there. Um, so the only thing I'm asking is, is for the school board, if this does go back, is to please evaluate, please re-educate the adults and, and know what the true risks are for children and for all of us and for you guys, because at some point we have to get back to normalcy. And I get the buzzers going off and we want to stop this conversation with me, but I don't, I'm not going to hear and just bash everybody. I just, I think we really need to educate people on what their true risks are, especially when we have the vaccines available for children, we have the vaccines available for adults, we have masking that we can debate all day whether they work or not. We haven't found a good study that does, but I'll end on that. And I just ask the board if it is put back in your hands to take serious consideration and giving us parents the choice back and that's it. Thank you thank very much. You, thank you. Okay. Would anyone else like please? Good evening. Hi. Uh, my name is Amanda Siano. I have a third grader in the school and I also have a UPK student. Um, I just want to piggyback really quick off of what was just said, but as far as uh, I've been coming to these meetings since I want to say maybe in October, I hear you guys up here and Fauci this and the World Health Organization this and CDC this. I just ask that you would also consider the sources that you're where you're getting your information. It's, it sounds like it's very one sided. I try to always um, look at things from both perspectives. So I would just like to ask that you guys would do the same. Um, so I first, I just want to thank Mr. McCree and the board for all of their hard work and dedication to the Warriorsville School community over these past two years. It hasn't been easy and I applaud your perseverance through it all. I'd like to address the board with some questions and concerns I have regarding the mask policy. We're all well aware of the recent debacle concerning the governor's unlawful mask mandate and it recently led me to ask my daughter if she was still allowed a mask break at school. She said no, they no longer get a mask break other than when they're eating snack, lunch, or they're outside. Now, it really, it hurt when I heard her say that because I know I wasn't aware of this and I don't recall getting a notice home saying that mask breaks were no longer allowed. So my question is, are they no longer allowed? And were parents ever told that our children weren't allowed to have mask breaks at school? Um, if they aren't allowed, was this to comply with the governor's unlawful mask mandate? And does the school have an official mandate order in writing by any governor body? Um, I've also heard of recent cases where children are being picked on because they're wearing paper masks to school or blue masks. Um, I'm wondering what the school is doing or if they're aware of this and what you're doing to address these issues. I'm also a parent of the UPK child, which I mentioned, um, and he is in the district who is receiving speech services and with what I would consider a somewhat uh, severe speech delay. We've all heard of recent studies that show masks are causing and further delaying children's speech development, and I would like to ask the board what is being done to combat these issues or prepare for them to so I'm sure you can understand my concerns as we're now approaching two full years of the school community mass. I just ask that you consider these and kind of want to know, are the mass breaks go? We, we, okay, and we will follow up with everything. So we are listening to what you have to say. So thank you very thank much you. for your comments. Okay. Would anyone else like to approach the board? Good evening. Good evening. I'll make this quick. Could you uh, tell us who you are? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to say. My name is Ben Kimmis. I've been here before. Yeah. I have a kindergartner uh, in the school district. And um, obviously, this is a divisive topic. We're talking about it again. It's being brought up. And obviously, we all know that it's inevitable before you come off. So I'd like to ask one of you guys tonight, when we get to Section 8, other business, one of the board members here tonight. Put a motion on the floor. I would like the board to discuss what a mask optional policy would look like. Whether it be let's survey the district, let's see what all the parents in the district are saying, ask them, find out. We have no idea. So I'd like somebody tonight to put a motion on the floor. Let's get a plan in place because it's only a matter of time before the governor, before this, this 
this lawsuit or whatever you want to call it, you know, gets rescinded or overruled or whatever, the state gets to take them off. I'm not aware, I don't know, but it's only a matter of time, so I'd like somebody to put on the floor because I'd like something. There has to be some kind of mechanism in place where you guys can roll out your law to the parents, what's it going to look like, and whether or not us parents can have the choice to send our, our children in with the mask. So that's it. I really don't have anything written down that's what I'd like. So I'd like to see that tonight. I'm hopeful. So let me put that on the floor tonight. Please and thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Would anyone else like to make a comment? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dennis. I'm a parent of an elementary student. Um, I know you guys, all I hear is that you guys say your hands are tied, and I understand that. So I guess most of my comments are going to be directed toward these fine people and any parents who are listening. We as parents are all here tonight because we love our kids. So we have some important things in common. Parents, we have com we have to come to a more common sense approach to dealing with everybody's different fears and concerns. I think most of us would agree that we are no longer in the scary March 2020 phase of Corona. The overwhelming majority of people in New York State have either gotten vaccinated and or attained natural antibodies from catching and beating COVID. On top of that, there is a, over a 99% survival rate. These are facts that cannot be disputed anymore. We know them to be true now. It is time to move on and live our lives without this crippling fear. Parents, it's time for us to all acknowledge that the mask charade cannot and will not last forever. Coming to an end, we must face it. It's time to accept it. It's part of the human experience. People get sick. Look around you. Uh, people are not falling down dead on the streets from this virus, thank God. We must think for ourselves and not be told what to think and what to fear. Use our own judgment and not live with our heads buried in the sand, avoiding a confrontation with the truth. Parents, please stop listening to the CDC who constantly contradict themselves and confuse the masses with unclear recommendations. However, if you are going to listen to them, then I urge you to please just Google CDC COVID-19 death by age, and you'll see clearly on their website that the kids in the age group 17 years and younger have barely lost 700 total lives since March 2020 in the U.S. 700 deaths are very sad, don't get me wrong, and tragic, yes. But as, as barely 1% of the total deaths from all causes in that age group, that means that kids in this age group who may have unfortunately meet with their death have a 99% chance of dying from something other than COVID. Take a look and let that sink in, people, please. Of all the kids I have personally known who have got COVID, none of them have had severe cases or lingering complications from it. For whatever reason, thank God, the kids are not that affected by this virus. Parents, we are, the, we are one of only 14 remaining states still implementing the harsh mandates upon children when they have a greater chance of dying from nearly anything else other than this virus. Many states are working to regain normalcy, and New York is next. We must end the mandate. They're completely unhealthy for our society, all mandates. Today, please go home and think about how we can do this together. The optional mask policy is the way out of this insanity. This is the first step. Let's give the kids back their innocence and their love of school, of life, and of childhood. Because every single morning, there are a lot of our kids dreading to go through another day at school wearing a mask. And all of our kids deserve better. And by working together, we can make it better. And I know the board is concerned about losing some funding, state and federal, but we can figure that out together. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Would anyone else like to? Hey guys, Carissa Mayer here. Good evening. Thank you. I wanted to thank everybody for their opportunity to speak tonight. Um, you know, I'm here. I have a son who is eight, um, soon to be nine, Nathan, and uh, my fifth grader is Caleb. Um, you know, we know COVID has become very much a political issue, which is very unfortunate. I'm a registered nurse, and I really think that, you know, we've made it about identity politics, unfortunately, and as a country. You know, even my kids come home, there's masker, unmasker, vaxxer, and they talk about this at school, and I don't know how much the teachers are in tune with this. Obviously, they hear this, and it's unfortunate because kids at a very young age, and I know you mentioned this with mental health issue prevalence on the rise, clinically speaking, I've seen that myself, um, and I'm very, very concerned about looking at that side of things. Um, not only am I a nurse, I have a child that has special needs, Nathan. He's lost tutoring at the school. 
I go to Mrs. Jordan's house every Saturday to get an hour of math tutoring because she's not allowed to do it at the school. He really needs that. It's critical for him to pass the grade. Um, he's now had two seizures, one grand mal and one silent seizure at Kids Club for masking. Um, he gets overheated. He sees a neurologist at Albany Med. Unfortunately, I can't get a medical exemption. We've lost sports at our school. Thankfully, thank you, Frank, for opening up some of the CYO for the younger kids at school. Um, childhood obesity is at an all-time epidemic right now. We talk about, you know, um, you know, pandemics. And not to mention mental health and substance abuse issues. I work day in and day out with that population and teen suicide rates are soaring right now. I'm very concerned that we're not looking at that. Um, our kids are being segregated by whatever label I said earlier. And you know, they're years behind academically. And there's teachers at the school. I know my kids come home, mom, I'm scared to breathe. I'm scared to sneeze. I'm scared to cough. I'll be sent to the nurse and sent home away from my friends. They'll have a COVID test. And these are the things our kids talk about day in and day out, and I'm done. I just feel like it's very, very unfortunate. I know you guys are faced with a lot of challenges here, but let's take for a moment common sense. My kids can go to sports. They wear their masks like this on a court. They wear their masks like that and events at restaurants. When I walk in a restaurant, it's funny how I can catch COVID any other place, but then as soon as I sit down, I take this off. Um, when I'm at a stadium with a, at a football game with my kids, I don't need to have it, it's not enforced. They go to school the next morning. My kids, my their dad was just home from a deployment. They went to Florida on Christmas break. No masks, it was wonderful. They went to the beach, they went to restaurants. They had such a good time. When they came back, they were healthy. They had lower rates in the state of Florida. Um, the issue here is it doesn't make common sense. And I think as adults and leaders, we have to question that all the time. It doesn't make common sense. We continue to write to our policymakers, but as someone said earlier, it seems very one-sided. This should not be a political issue. It should be about our kids. So I'm asking for a few things from the board. I know I'm over time here. I agree with a survey. Could we survey our teachers, our parents, and our kids? Kids don't want to speak up to teachers. What did the governor say? Something It's like putting shoes on? Shame on you. Shame on you. Um, put back tutoring and sports for our kids. The benefits outweigh the risks. And Frank, you did a survey when we reopened school. I think it's time for parents to weigh in on what would a mask optional policy if we did it. If masks work well, I'm, I'm not anti anything. I just think parent choices fall through the wayside, and that's so important right now. We focus more on masks than correcting any of the social norms that are being taken away from our kids. We have every right as parents to make decisions. And medical exemptions. Is there a way to get a medical exemption? Um, my son sees a top neurologist at Albany Med who would love it if he could get an exemption. Um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay. Well, thank you everyone um, for all of your comments and they've all been listened to. Um, we have, if we have time at the end of the meeting, I will read some of these emails in order of what time they were received. Otherwise they will be posted with the minutes um, this month, but for the, the, after this month, um, we'll take live comments on. Okay, so we have a, a busy, important meeting this evening, starting right now with our first draft budget presentation. Okay. By Mr. So for the community members that may not know Jim, I'd like to just introduce him really quick. Uh, Jim Southern is our assistant superintendent of finance and operations for the district, and Jim really is the master of funds. <laughs> So, as you're setting that up, I just wanted to kind of preface it. As Jim and I will talk about, the budget process started for us in boy, last year. <laughs> um, it never really ends, and we're already working on the budget for next year and the year after that. It's a continual kind of look. And our main goal is to keep a sustainable district where we can continue to have growth and make sure that whatever we are putting in place is something that we can continue to put in place no matter any funding that comes our way. Um, we start the formal process in late October, 
um, with our building administrators, director of facilities, transportation directors, food service directors. There you go. I was stalling, Jim. Uh, I know. And we start all of that information <laughs> then, and then from that point, we begin our budget. We also utilize our board um, of education committee meetings, our district advisory council meetings, any conversation that comes up with those, and that's how we really, we kind of take in all key points, we look at some data points um, to make a comprehensive budget. So with that, can we start? <laughs> and Jim and I basically said we're going to tag team this tonight, and so we'll be cutting each other off, but please understand it's, it's pretty normal for us. <laughs> it is. It, so uh, just to start off with some important dates along the way, tonight, the initial presentation. February 23rd, Board of Education conditions are available. This is all on the budget process uh, that was approved by the board. March 1st, we have our deadline for filing the tax cap calculation with the Office of State Comptroller. March 7th, updates, if any, are going to be made to the proposed budget at the next board meeting. We expect to have the budget adopted and the property tax report card adopted by the Board of Education on the April meeting. Move forward, deadline for petitions is the 18th. Absentee ballots will be made available the 19th. The absolute drop dead deadline for board approval is the 25th. May 9th, we hold our budget hearing. May 17th is the vote. So those are the important dates as we start out. Factors of revenue, that's usually the most important piece. And that doesn't look great in gold. Okay, I'll have to change that. Um, state aid makes up. <laughs> Just the funny thing is we actually tried this year to make it a little bit better for people to see. So, purple. We'll fix it. Oh, okay, 25.81% uh, is state aid according to the current run. The tax levy makes up just over 70%. We are using a 2.5% increase, which is below the allowed tax levy increase at 4.05. Jim, I just want to speak really quick. That 2.5, we can go to the 405 for all purposes that we're using tonight and within the budget that we created for first round draft. We utilize 2.5 for them. Other revenue is 1.38%, very small, local. Federal revenue is only Medicaid funds, and that makes up one seventh of 1%. Uh, we want to put in an allocated fund balance of 2.5%, which is $700,000, so that we can follow kind of the normal budgeting process for a year. As I mentioned during the audit committee, in a normal, quote unquote, normal year, you're going to spend 97.5% of your budget, you're going to receive 97.5% of it in revenue, and we want those to balance out. So our projected current gap is zero, which is unusual this early in the process. State aid from the executive state budget. Uh, state aid for the governor's proposal was 7414965, which was shown on that document. Uh, one thing you should note is universal pre-K is not a general fund item, it is a grants item, so it has to be pulled out. Uh, the amount budgeted for 21-22 with some uncertainty was 6.1 million. It looks like we're actually going to get about 6.5 million per the presentation of the governor's budget. Our projected state aid in our draft budget is about $150,000 less than what the governor suggested we would get. That is due to the way the proposals go in. We fill in our SD3 with our budget numbers. They usually end up a little higher than they end. And so that lowers proposed aid and transportation aid a little, which is why we made that adjustment. Hey, Tim, the yep. projected actual 6.5, that's 2021. 21-22, correct, yep. And you can actually look at the governor's uh, summary there and see that. So. The tax levy cap. Maximum CPI adjustment is capped at 2%. That is what you hear when you hear 2% tax cap, but it's only one piece of the entire process. The actual CPI they are they have is 4.7% for the measurement period. 
if we were able to use that 4.7%, we could have an increased taxing capacity of almost half a million dollars. CPIU is the measure that they use. It is not a very good measure for a very uh, staff heavy process. And that, that 4.7 is reflecting income. Correct. Yep. And even though it's not a good measure, it clearly shows that we're over that 2%. Anyway, um, when we factor everything else in, being personal heavy, we'd be somewhere around 6, probably. It's my guess. The tax cap is the calculation. So we start with our current year tax levy. We have a growth factor of 1.68%, which is how many new properties or expanded properties we have in the district. The capital levy exclusion of current year is zero, which is a deduct, so nothing happens there. You apply the CPI factor of 2% to arrive at the tax levy limit. So that would be 3.72. The only known exclusion that we can take is the next year capital levy exclusion for capital projects and purchasing of buses, which is $63,000. When you add that together, you have 4.05% as the cap for the tax levy increase. Our current draft includes 2.5% compared to that 4.05. And we must know, because of that growth factor, we believe that the tax rate will go up less than 1% based on past history. Does that question answer? Other revenue, local revenues like interest, refund of prior year's expenses, with interest earnings being very minimal right now, segment cannot be increased without overstating the amount, so we're keeping that flat for this upcoming year. Federal revenue, uh, you may remember last year we included the new funds from Carissa, and that was a mistake. <laughs> it should have been over in the grant funds, but that's okay. We're fixing it now. It's all over in the grant funds. Chris is CRSSA, <laughs> so <laughs> just not a person to me. The ARP, the American Rescue Plan, passed in March 2021, and our share of the normal funds, I'll call them, is 282,000. There is also some special ed funding that we're looking at and um, claiming that equals about 60,000 in addition to that. So. Okay, so let's go to the actual expense side of the budget now. Jim, yep. I just want to state to, I know you're going to get to it, the foundation aid for the district, the state is actually going to be funding us to where we are, get us fully funded. So we are seeing $600,000 next year, right? That's the projection, yes. We projected $600,000 from state aid, which is not typical for us. No. Usually it's, gosh, I don't, like 30000 as an I'll, increase. I'd call it 2%, because yeah. that's usually where they <laughs> right. yeah. So it is a much different... So they are funding us fully for foundation aid. And over the next two years, we are projected to be fully funded. Yeah. So we start with a rollover budget. We adjust services and other items. We adjust staffing. We adjust employee benefits. And we adjust debt service items for new um, borrowings coming on and old borrowings going up. So services and items. Our contracts is, uh, our telephone system that we just upgraded has had quite a few little wiggles as we've gone through the upgrade process. So we want to put a maintenance contract in place to limit the expenses of that. There are needed maintenance projects at all buildings and fields and network, camera upgrades, 100,000 capital out. There's, there's a lot there and we've tried to put in enough that we can make a dent in it let me explain that a little bit. So one-off things we can do, and those one-off things can also then fund for the following year because then you also get aid from those one-offs. A lot of this work for the maintenance projects and different things is those one-offs. So let's talk about the security, for example. We have a camera system that's failing, so we do need to look at increasing our camera systems. 
we have a network that we're working on to be able to have a K-12 network that is really of high end and be able to meet the needs of our staffing and our students. So that's still work that we have to put into. Our fields and athletic maintenance, this year our, geez, um, this year our tennis courts are basically at a point where they need to be scraped and back put on together. Roughly, the quote was, I believe, almost $200,000. For the full, yes. For the full idea of a full pull and redo. Also, our track is up for resurfacing. That's another $125,000. So these are big ticket items that are due on the facilities maintenances. And on the facilities, our tennis court is getting to the point where it's almost unplayable because of the large cracks that are in it and making it very unsafe. So these are large items that we're looking at doing. On top of that, we still always try to do every year a $100,000 outlay project on each building. This year was the elementary school, and that went with the, um, the drainage system that we have the potholes in what we talked about, and a couple of things within the building. Next year, we, we want to focus in on the middle school, high school. So every year, we still want to do a $100,000 project, which is again, aidable, but we want to keep on going back and forth so we can do some of the maintenance projects to keep the buildings up to a point where we won't have to put in large scale aspects to it. I'm going to go keep going, Jim, if that's all right. Um, the staff have been discussing a new reading program prior to myself getting here. Um, so this is something at the elementary school that they've been looking into. So the district advisory council, the building leadership teams, they've been looking into doing a reading program at the elementary school. Roughly, I believe, don't, Jim, you're going to tell me if I'm wrong on this. I believe we budgeted out 80000 for the program and $25,000 for professional development to go along with the program. Exactly correct. Sure. We do not have a set program yet, but it's something that is still being looked into. Um, but we do want to have a place or, or make sure that if and when the project is going through and we have that curriculum we want to make sure that we're doing it correctly as we can the in-service training for the new program we already talked about both services including installment purchases uh, we utilize the installment purchases one of our bigger issues is our copiers are now five years out if you're a teacher and you saw an email basically every day there is an email going out that one of the copiers in the district is not working um, so it's really getting to the point where we need to redo our copiers and redo that Along with that system, you can put in um, something called paper cup or a similar system into it, which now allows you to be able to manage your systems and make sure your paper levels are down. So there's a cost savings that goes along with this as well. And then um, technology upgrades for each school and devices and network. Do you want to talk about that quickly? So uh, we, during the current year, upgraded the Wi-Fi network down at the elementary school. This next year, we have some work to do up at the middle school, high school to bring it up to uh, standards. That would also include any devices, um, tablets at the lower grades in the elementary or replacement Chromebooks to try to get us to one-to-one, -one, things like that. Um, the installment purchases work together with the devices so that we can purchase you know, displays, or uh, other items over a longer term so we can have this rolling expense and keep upgrading things as we go along. That's allowed through BOCES and it's able through BOCES. So it's a, it's a very nice plan. Uh, replace the pool timing equipment. That was one specific item that had come to the end of its useful life and we put that in as a separate line item for the athletics. Program. And just so you know, it's a shared pool program so we would pay for a portion of that and then Gilderlin would then take on the other portion of it because it's a shared team so are they doing that now with the property being here yes yeah yeah it's a shared services so right. we pay for portions of the coach they pay for portions of the coach and it's split even right right oh the time is split it so it would be like a share yes it's anything that's on the property okay Staff, the only staffing position that we have added from last year to this is an additional kindergarten section based on our enrollment projections. And that would require having a teaching assistant for that room as well. So those are the two staff items that we've added into the budget. But we have not taken out the social worker that was put in at the elementary school. We have not taken out the AIS teacher that was put in at the elementary school. One of the classes is now kind of capping out where we did have five sections before and four sections we added an extra. We could then take that section out and just have four, but we said, no, we're going to keep it in this five, so we keep those class sizes down. So there's no cuts, and we're sustaining the amount of staffing that we continue to have within the district and be able to continually grow in our elementary school. 
And based on our enrollment projections, it's going to be essentially one section every year going for at least for the next two years after this. We're program. anticipating five sections per grade level, probably within three years. Employee benefits, uh, ERS has actually reduced. Can I just stop real quick? Is there any questions? We're moving pretty quick. Is there any questions from the board up until this point? No questions, but uh, is the enrollment projection adding another section three years in a row? We're going to run out of space. Yeah, we're yes. third <laughs> Well, that's what we're working on. So we are looking at a capital um, improvement project to be able to add 12 classrooms to the elementary school. Um, we're just trying to finalize where that, how those funds are going to be working because there's a couple little things in play um, that we're trying to work through right now. And until I have a finalization of what route we can go in as a district, which is more cost effective, that could either be a partnership or on our own of building a transportation facility, um, it's really hard to be able to say we can go out for a project until we know those answers. And as those classrooms get larger, the number of classes get larger, the grade levels get larger, the auditorium and the lunchroom don't really seat everyone either, as the gathering spaces are not large enough for the size of a gather. Right. And in the facilities committee, we've looked at it. It's a, oh my gosh, I don't want to quote how big it is. It's this big. It's three minutes. It's a large cafeteria um, that would also double as a community space. So it would be offset from the rest of the district. So that way at night, you can basically lock it and it can be a community use area as well. Um, but it is definitely a large cafeteria. We'd be moving the cafeteria out, creating spaces there. Right now, we do have spaces that we can use, but it basically is taking every room that we have in our elementary school in order to do that at this time. So you lost the science room. Not yet. Okay. It's still there. That would be such a yeah. great thing. So what is the current enrollment for kindergarten? Currently, we are, it's hard to tell because, you know, they keep coming and coming and coming, so I don't have current numbers. Our estimated enrollment for next year is anywhere between 105 and 116. Uh, so, and do we want to keep those class sizes down to 17, 18 students in a classroom? So that means we have to get a six teacher in there for that purpose. When did they do? When did, is it March? It's it's in late spring, but really they come in in July. Yeah, but they, then they trick us. But yeah. I mean, when is it usually? June. June. By June, we get our final number, more or less. But it's always much better to have something there that you don't absolutely need then not have it and have to scramble for it. Oh, so it, it, that's the way we're approaching this budget. Frank, when you say five sections for every, you mean K-8? K I'm saying at the elementary school at this point. K-5. Yeah, K at the high school, it's going to be a little bit different because school, as we talked yeah. to curriculum committee, they start to spread out in different levels and different things. So by six eighth grade, seven. you're having a whole bunch of different kinds of courses. Oh. But six and seven would be still nice to be Yeah, And next year, six will be at fifth grade. So ERS is down a little bit this year, uh, which is very good. ERS, however, which is our vast majority of our staff, is up. Nine. It was at 9.5 last year. 10.29 is the projected number for this year. That's a significant increase. Workers' compensation is going up only about 2%. Our mod is very good, uh, so that's no issue right now. Health insurance and prescriptions are projected to be flat overall. We believe we can handle it within the budget number that we have. And RX is still working? It is. Yep. Debt service, our new payment for our new final borrowing that we did for the current project comes off. And uh, as we talked about in the uh, tax cap levy, the difference between what we receive in aid and what we have to spend on debt service, $63,000 is used in that calculation. Summary. God, I wish that was a different color. Um, projected expenses of 28,146,611, projected revenues of 28,146,611. Projected revenue assumes below tax cap increase of $481,000. Significantly increased state aid, mostly foundation aid, 50% due amount, and the allocated fund balance that we've talked about. Projected gap is zero. Any new funds, this is just my perspective. It's 
not necessarily the board's perspective, and we'll talk about that. Uh, from the final state budget, if we get anything new, it should be used to reduce the allocated fund balance or one-time expenses to prevent creation of a fund. You never want to depend on found money for continuing expenses, is the, the way I say it. So. Can you explain to us what you mean by funding? So, whenever you have a new influx of money, and it may go away in the future, or there may be adjustments in the future. Uh, you don't want to create a situation where you're spending more than you will eventually have. So if that revenue goes down, you're going to be up here with your expenses and down here with your revenues, and that's the cliff. You fall off that. So the concern is we're getting a lot of new federal dollars, state funding is at an all-time high, and if that starts to go away, we have spending obligations Continue on that amount, we're going to hit a cliff. 2011, right. when, when we saw that same cliff, right. yes. this is something that is really stacking up to possibly be very similar to that time frame. And if anyone was in education at that time, you know, you don't want to be doing those things and having to go through what schools had to go through during at the point in time with cuts. So um, 2011, it was very similar. Beforehand, schools were in money. They were, they were hiring, hiring, hiring. There was all these other things going on, 2009, 2010, 2011, the funding was hit, GDA came out, and then all of a sudden you just saw major, major cuts across the state to be able to hit that funding cliff. And that lasted for a good three years before it was able, or even more than that. And, and it hasn't even built back. Yeah. I think they said like 2021 was when it built back to where it was before the funding cliff hit. So just writing on the wall, we want to be very careful just to make sure we don't hit something similar to that that as well before it's paying attention all the time yeah we just want to be careful that's the that's the, that's the hub. and and that's really my job and frank's job but you also have to be aware of it as well because you play a factor in it, uh with your decisions and how you approach things and so we want to make sure that you're aware of it. uh questions that's the last slide. Could you go over um, in prior years? There's always a talk about if you don't fall all the way up to your tax cap, that you could potentially be leaving money on the table for future years. I'm not suggesting we do one thing or the other. I'm sure. just wondering if you could help touch on this. So, the general idea with the tax cap is it is what you're allowed to increase based on all the factors involved. So a lot of people say you should go right up to your tax cap every single year so that you don't hurt yourself in future years. That's, in my opinion, okay to a point. You never want to get in a situation where you have the bonanza year that's then going to be followed with a zero. You want to try to keep it steady, keep it moving steadily, yeah, one year you may leave a little on the table. You do have the ability in future years to pull some back if you're below your tax cap. So you're not completely leaving it on the table if you get yourself into a difficult situation. Um, but it is a factor. You have to consider that when you're looking at it, sir. So the past few years, we have went to the max of our tax cap. Um, and then, honestly, that's been my model, as, as many people know, is to go out at it. But we also haven't had a model where we've also had $600,000 of foundation aid coming in, but we've never had that before. So that's brand new. Also adding on to it, we never had a tax cap that was over 4%. So, you know, that's, that, a, big, you know, that's a big, that's a big, you know, big issue there. So, you know, being a taxpayer myself and looking at it as, you know, being fiscally responsible, you know, we have to look at it and say, what are the funds that we're getting? What are the things that we're going to do sustainably throughout the next few years? And you know, where are we not doing it? And Jim and I both feel at this point, there's no money being left on the table where it's going to cause any issues given what we're seeing, but we are mindful of what we're seeing three years on the road. Hence the reason you see a lot of the things that we're doing are one-offs that then can be building aid for 23, 24. And we plan on doing the same thing for 23, 24 because we understand that there probably will be a funding left 25 days. Um, so really when we're looking at it, those are, that's the way that we're approaching budgets. Um, we're not just doing the one year and saying, here's where it is. 
If we can always stay between 2.5 and 3, I already told Jim, I said, if we can live in that area and know what we're going to be for the rest of the time, you know, that'd be great. I don't think we can. It's going to be really difficult. But we would love to try to be able to be sustainable within what we're doing each year. I, I do appreciate what is being done, though, with this budget and with the students. It's the focus on kind of plays to what you discussed before, RG, that there are more people available to help the students with their smaller class sizes so teachers can give the students the attention that they need and that that is like that seems to be a focus of the budget and of the, the way things are moving forward but with that in mind i do have a question this has come up before and i'm if anyone could do it it would be you but i'm for every percentage that it goes up how much money is that to the taxpayer? Like, I remember someone said if it goes up 2.5% or something, that's like $20. It's dependent or on, oh, uh, that, that's that dependent on your equalization rate. So it's yeah. very, yeah. that's yeah. a huge. I, I can do the 1% of the levy is X overall. Okay. At, at this point, I really can't do, break it down by house. Yeah. Uh, we will certainly pull <laughs> that something in for, for March. Thousand dollars, it's yeah. like of your house, it's an extra whatever. So we would say that, but if you look back yeah. to the equalization rate in 2017 in Gilderland, which when I just bought my oh. house in Weatherfield area, oh, yeah, that was and so the schools don't have control of equalization rates, the equalization rate skyrocketed, yeah. and the taxpayers in that in the area, yeah. oh my gosh, I think it was 50% more than what we expected to pay. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a situation that came out of it. So even though you say it's going to be less, what I think we have to look at is, our growth ratio is some is, is fantastic. It's one of the highest in the state. Am I correct in saying that? It is. Yeah. So that in and with having the tax levy is easily distributed across our community. You say growth ratio. What what are you referring to? Jim, answer that please. <laughs> so the growth ratio is the difference between this year and the year before on new properties and expanded properties. So it's one point six eight percent. Most districts are below half a percent. To give you a comparison, growth in our property tax. Right. The the new growth. Now reassessments and things like that don't count in because that's an existing property. But and again, I think it's important to note what Jim said in the very beginning, is that roughly twenty percent or twenty five percent of our budget is state funded, seventy percent of our budget is taxpayer funded. You know, and that's you know, so yes, you know, we're able to do that. We have these beans within our community, but that's a larger burden. And other school districts do not see that type of ratio. You know, it's usually maybe a little bit different, or maybe it's 30% taxpayer funded and 70% is you know state funded. So we are, you know, we are very taxpayer dependent in Boris in comparison to other districts. So I think this foundation aid growth is, is a very positive thing for us. Right. That's why I like it what you project proposed here, because it really does respect taxpayers' ability to pay. And we are very dependent upon those local taxpayers. Absolutely. And we know that it's just not a, you know, not a blank checkbook. Nice. Two blank checkbook. Good, good point. Well, I, I, I really appreciate both Jim and Frank um, starting the budget process early for us, for explaining where your thoughts are going before we get there, because this is like, I tell you, in the superintendent, this is like what Board of Education is very important role of ours. So we thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on now to the superintendent report. Okay, so I have two quick things to say. First off, um, in my office, there are 1,200 COVID tests. Um, <laughs> It's, it's not, I'm not joking, there are really boxes and boxes of COVID tests. We've been getting them from the state each time. Um, they are there, we plan on, the principals are gonna work with their communities and send it out. We might do another kind of pickup as well, um, but before February break, we do plan on sending another one. You know, that's kind of the initiative of the state. So we're gonna ask that families then prior to sending children back to school, maybe up on any spread that could possibly happen for break that you have the test available. You get, again, it is completely up to the community to get them. Um, if there is any other time the communities want them, we have them in our nurses' offices. I mean, people can pick up a COVID test as needed. Um, we do have a plenty at this point, and we're seeking plenty from the state. So opposite from where we were in the past, where we can barely get a COVID test at all, um, 
we've changed. So we have our COVID test that we have, plus we still have our quadrant um, lab testing, lab PCR test that we offer. Um, and that really does help with the ability to stop having students not, with, not missing school um, because we're not doing all the contact tracing that we used to be doing. And so there's really nothing quote unquote quarantines initiated by the school district, but we're still having some notifications. Families, if they are in contact with someone who has had COVID, they can test to stay utilizing the school program. And that really has cut our numbers down with students that are missing out on school. Our number one goal, as we said before, was getting kids back and getting us back to a normal place and keep on moving forward with our mitigation strategies and where we are so we can, you know, more and more get into a, a place where we are back to what we would call school. So with a lot of these things that we keep on filtering in at a slower pace, that's the state program we just did a couple weeks ago. Um, it really is starting to work out in our community. Question yes. about the tests. I've noticed that other districts also have a drive-by pickup. Is it possible to send them back via home via backpacks or not? So um, there's a few issues with sending home via backpacks. We are going to talk about that at the elementary school for the end, but you got to understand you're sending them home. It's a medical device. So parent has to A, first request that we do send it home. And then B, because we just can't send home a medical device to say, hey, by the way, we're sending it home. It's not what we yeah. can do. But you also have to understand that, you know, you got to make sure that the students aren't doing anything with those, you know, oh, yeah. not, you know, using a Q-tip on the, on the boss and sticking no. them, you know, no. that would be bad things. Um, so we are really, we're pushing for having parents pick them up and doing it. We have sent a few home. Um, you know, per parent request, and we do plan on sending home some. That's why I said the building principles we work with their communities. Um, but a lot of schools really are veering away from the yeah. mass exodus of sending them home with backpacks. Yeah, I noticed that most schools they yeah. didn't have a car lineup. Like, yeah, because again, it's a medical device. Yeah. Right. So really, sending that home. <laughs> there are some kids I trust more than others. <laughs> Take I'm trying to get someone put in to get to the school to find a way. To oh, we send them home with backpacks. I mean, we've done it, you know, and yeah. if someone can get here and they, you know, and they want one for their child, we're more than happy to send it home as long as they tell us, you know, give us verbal written permission. And or you know they're taking it out yeah. of yeah, but yeah. Yeah. it could be so in there. Yeah. Yeah. But if we were just to send it home, like we send home notifications sometimes, we put them in the kids' folders. <laughs> They'll, like be, there there. There. That's one They'll be there in June. June. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a good question. But yeah, majority of us are all doing the same thing, but we are looking yeah. at possibilities. Um, and that actually is a good segue into my next statement. Um, you know, a lot of us within the capital region, I'm very, very lucky, you know, to work in the capital region with superintendents at the 24 school districts here. It's been great. Through the past two years, we've all worked in unison with each other. Even though maybe it's veered a little bit here or there, we've all kind of been on the same page, having those same conversations. With that being said, now we do know that the state mandate for masks goes out on March 2nd at this point in time. We don't really understand what's going to happen. And there's a lot that's still up in the air. You know, and again, as I think one of our parents said today, some of the stuff is still out of our control. But the superintendents are all working together. We're looking at working with the Department of Health to look at plans and what can be done as a whole in our communities to see where plans are. So if there is going to be a takeaway off of masks or a change, that we're doing it kind of even keel throughout the rest of the community. That's all I want to say. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. Minutes, uh, regular meeting. Can I have a motion? Move. I can we can second, right? Yeah, they're all they're, they're all set. That's right. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 So let's take five point one treasurer's report. Can I have a motion to move that? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I wanted to um, take personnel items by itself because we have several impressive retirements um, on the agenda. I think I added it up to almost 150 years of service, so that's outstanding. <laughs> and we'll certainly, certainly miss so many, I mean, you know, there's so many people on on this agenda um, that have just done wonderful, wonderful things for this district, and they'll be sorely missed. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, and as each retirement comes up, we'll be more than happy um, to to celebrate them. 
So with that in mind, with that taken aside, can I have um, a motion to move 5.2 personnel items? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's see. So moving right along here, we can take a lot of personnel. So 5.3 to 5.5 CSC recommendations, BOCES sub list, approval of an agreement with ice hockey merger. Can I have a motion to move those three items, please? I just have one question on 5.3. Yeah. So it references um, the agreement with ice hockey merger. Yeah. Is if we have a student who met the maturity test, so that's the section two, and it goes through that maturity test and testing up into that. And I believe per section two, that would be there. I don't want to give an answer because that's something I definitely would have to check with the athletic directors. Say one hundred percent yes. My first inclination is yes, but let me recheck that and then let the board know. Okay. okay. This is for next season, but this is for next year. Yeah, so, so right done. now it's it's I don't know if they've ever had an eighth grader that has done it before, but grades nine through twelve is a varsity sport. So I believe if there's an eighth grader that would be able to do it the same as varsity they can, but I don't have a complete answer. Okay. Eight. That's it. Why are you requesting to put it on next yeah, on March I think agenda? So this shouldn't hold anything up if we just bounce it to March, right? No, I do have a question though that I just need clarification on. Yeah. So when I do go to Joe and the athletic committee on this, the other five schools, it's five schools all together in section two. So we're requesting if it's not there, we're requesting that eighth graders then would have the ability to then be a part of it. Okay. For all those five schools. Well, we don't right, have right. I don't yeah. want to constrain any other schools. Right. It's it's a five five they, number. They need maturity test and they're skilled enough mm -hmm. to play varsity. Mm -hmm. Help them mature. Okay, it's a chance for it. Do you want to do that? Yeah, do you want to do that? Yeah, it's a it's a check. Okay. We'll we'll be checking with um the athletic director. So we can. Why don't we just put that one on hold for now until we get an answer? So can I um then can I have a motion for 5.3 and 5.4, please? Okay, second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and we will come back to the hot Okay, moving on to old business. Um, Chair RG, could you please give us an update on the audit committee? Sure, thank you. So the audit committee met earlier this evening. The focus of the meeting was really on the budget presentation, which we spent a lot of time going over this evening. Um, Jim gave us a good overview of the process as well as the governor's aid proposal and how that estimated tax cap actually was applied. Um, so we covered all of that. We also went over the November and December school lunch profit and loss statements. Um, and the good news is we are finally in the black um, in terms of our school lunch profit and loss. Um, and that really is due to those extra purchases. Students are making, um, well, I know my kids, waters, multiple waters a day, Doritos, all of those things are really propping up um, mm -hmm. the, the school lunch box. So that's great okay. news. Um, and other than that, than that, we just reviewed. Um, how we're doing against our projections, actual expenses versus um, um, what we budgeted, and we're in great shape there. That's it. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Curriculum Committee Chair Tim. Yes, uh, we met on January 25th. Uh, the committee was all present: That's Frank, Rachel, Kelly, uh, myself, Trish, and uh, Karen Conroy. Um, we talked about two things. One were some course proposals that have been put forward. One would be for public speaking, and the other for creative writing it would be available for 12th graders. Uh, it's possible, perhaps, that 11th graders might be able to take part in these classes. Uh, they would not be available for college credit at this time. 
uh, but to be determined in the future. Uh, no budgetary implications in that we already have the teachers and the staff to do it. These are very common additions to the elect English electives uh, in other school districts uh, in high school. Uh, question came up as to whether or not these courses could be used to help with the college essay writing responsibilities that kids might have. And uh, that question was posed to Mr. Stumbaugh, who later on told us that uh, either course, uh, by be it the public speaking or the creative writing, could include an assignment related to uh, college essay writing as part of the fall curriculum. So that was course proposal. We did also have a second agenda item on the elementary projected enrollment and budget impacts. Uh, we we see that there is a bubble of uh, kids coming up through the kindergarten and we didn't know how that was gonna play out as far as our availability to accommodate that. We had a very good conversation about how those sections will be distributed across uh, the uh, five grades at the elementary level. We heard a little bit about that already tonight. Um, we talked about uh, the ability to expand the elementary staff over the next few years, uh, but We've got to do this in a very measured way. Uh, the cost to add a person to our uh, payroll is approximately $75,000 to take into salary and insurance. Um, and while the money might be there, uh, we, as was pointed out earlier, we might not have the additional classroom space. That's the biggest issue we're going to have as growth goes forward. And we'll be eventually looking at some way that we're going to have to deal with capital improvements or a new building project. Um, uh, let's see. Currently, there is no way to add on to the elementary school, so we're going to have to probably look at the transportation spaces there. Um, we talked about the funding flips in the curriculum committee and how uh, taking on too much uh, at one time uh, could haunt us later on. Um, so we want to do some kind of small steps, uh, sustainable budget as we grow. Um, and then we ended it with talking a little bit about, and brought up tonight, a little bit about a, uh, a new reading program um, whereby we could make sure that we are attending to the reading needs of all students. Uh, so some students who are English language learners, some students who uh, may have some special needs, um, and uh, it, it sounds like we're really trying to upgrade that reading program for the early grades. So that's my report. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Facilities Committee, Chair Rob. This will be my fastest update ever because we did not meet. Oh. We'll be tomorrow at 4 o'clock and uh, talk about the pool time. Okay. We look forward to hearing from you in March. Rachel, Chair, Policy? Policy will be meeting on Wednesday at 3.30. I invite you all to watch. Okay, and we look forward to hearing you at, from you at our March meeting. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to new business. Um, 7.1 approved resolution re-approval of RFP for energy performance contract. Frank, did you want to give us a quick? Yeah, and Jim can help me with this as well. So the approval for the RFP for the energy performance contract is just for Mosaic to work with a vendor to then give the proposals to the board of if an energy performance contract is something that the board would like to look at. I think I'm going to do this, but I, do, I want Jim to also then kind of lay it out for us as well. An energy performance contract allows a district to utilize the cost savings that they'll see from all the things that they put into the district to space, to space that out over a period of years to pay for it without upfronting anything from your capital reserves. So then if you have another project that you're looking at going out for, let's say it's an elementary school and transportation facility, and you have 2.5 in your capital reserves to utilize for that, you're not using that for the other stuff that you wanna do with your energy performance contract. So it's a way then to really do two projects at once with, you know, you have funds, but it's a way to maximize the funds within the district. You don't have to do that. It's not something you need to do as a board. You can say, no, I'd rather do a building project and fold in all the energy stuff at the same time. But you know, then you're utilizing all the funds to meet the same needs of everything that's there. So you know, my recommendation will be is to listen to what has to be said about the EPC, to have a better understanding of it, 
And then at that point, it's not something you want to do. You say, nope, no thank you. It's not something we want to go down. We can do it another way and go from there. But it's really no loss just to be able to understand what it is. Now, again, an EPC, is, as a quick refresher, is it's an energy performance contract that basically states anything that's been done within the district within the past 15 years isn't allowable for energy. Anything that's before that is. So all your LED lights, which we've done some, but there's a ton of LED lights that have not been done in our classrooms and our hallways. So in larger areas, that can be done. It is also our desert air system, which is on our building condition survey in our pool room. That's something that is something we could look into doing, along with a few other things in our building condition survey. So all of those things together could be put on. So the more savings, the more things we could put on. Jim, so, did I miss anything? I would say the one advantage of doing the EPC separately is that you can track all the savings from it and be very clear on what you've saved through this project and that you've covered the cost. Then you're getting the state aid, which can offset another project, essentially. Yeah. So, I mean, having it discrete is helpful as far as tracking, I would say. Questions? So the question I had was, what is, do we get state aid back for it? Yes. The answer is yes. It, does it cover all of the costs, or what's the amount? It's the, the same percentage as a regular capital project. Um, Generally, what they say is the savings is going to cover the payment on the capital lease, and then the state aid is the bonus. Okay. So. And I do want to state that I'm not like, oh my gosh, we're going to do an EPC. Because I want to be clear, we have to see what is going to be given to us after that point. I mean, I have an expectation, but I don't know what that expectation is going to, you know, what is it going to actually be. So I'm not going to say after we get it, oh, this is great, we have to do it. We really have to look and see, is it going to be cost effective for the district? Right. Like what what are we giving up in terms of having that contract that someone else is kind of giving us our benefit? So the one benefit. good thing that they do is they maximize every grant that's humanly possible as well. So something that we wouldn't be able to do on our own in comparison to that is understanding every little nuance of energy performance grants or anything that's out there. They know where all, they the know are all it is. Okay. You know, so you know, that's another aspect of it as well. So what we would generally do is we would treat it as any other capital project, set it up as a capital lease over 15 years. The savings covers the cost of that 15 years. Everything's paid off. After that, it's free money, essentially. Or you can turn around and do another project and save even more. So it, it's we try to run it very similar to a capital project. And Jim, when we do a capital project, what's the, how many years do we lease that out for? So it's 15 years for a renovation project. If you're adding on, it's 20 years. If you're building new, it's 30 years. So there are different levels, but generally when you're talking about a capital project, you're talking about 15 years. So, so I assume though that there's some estimate of what the cost is to do whatever the project is. And if our savings paid it back sooner than the 15 years, Still well, so it has to fall within the 18 years, which is what state ed says. We would treat it as 15 years. Um, basically, we could save more than we're paying and have a little bit extra during those 15 years that we're paying back. All right. I'll stop asking. No, 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 these are great. Did but Jim, can, Jim knows these answers much better than I can do. Richard, did you have any further questions? Uh, since this is just the RFP and not us actually agreeing to a contract, I, I was a little confused when I first went to the board of sales and started asking questions. So you've been there? I like the RFP. Yeah, I'd like to see you know what they have to say so we can understand it. Just test drive. No yeah, and as John said, it's basically an interview. We're interviewing those people to see if it's going to be beneficial. And it's good for them because the better they make it for us, the better it is for them as well. So, you know, it really is, you know, there's been some very positive things from EPCs that some districts have done. And, um, you know, that's where it is kind of very kind of interesting. And since we haven't done a lot of energy conservation work here for the past 15 years, I mean, we've done a lot with, you know, the ventilators in the high school and the lights. 
but across the district there hasn't been a ton done, this is a great opportunity to really push us forward. Yeah, I'll be happy to take a look at any. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, so why don't we take 7.1, 7.2, 7.3 donations, very generous from Hanford to the elementary school. And a big thank you to them. And so can I group 7.1 through 7.3 and ask for a motion, please? Move it. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, terrific. So did Joe, did you get back to me? Oh, okay. Um, Joe, Mr. Athletic Director, Mr. Sapienza, yeah, so did get back. Brian, on so, your question, Archie? So can we go, go back Can we to that? go back? Yeah, Mr. Sapienza yeah, stated, and I'm going to make sure. Beautiful thing about technology is so that you can <laughs> find out things very quickly. Um, he actually said it's pretty common that middle schoolers, as long as they're cleared and they're, they have the ability for the advanced placement to do it, that they do it. And that's within all five school districts. Okay. It's at two satisfaction five. Okay, so back to 5.5, approval of agreement um, for the ice hockey merger. Can I have a motion to move that? I'll move it. <laughs> second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay, hey, opportunity for the board to be heard. I have one thing. Uh, on Thursday of this week, the New York State School Board Association is uh, hosting a webinar on, uh, to a great extent, the board's role in curriculum development and adoption. And uh, I know I signed up. I think Rachel signed up. I don't know if anyone else did. It's uh, from uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're all, it's free, uh, and they put together a really nice little curriculum guide to accompany it. Uh, I sent that out to the curriculum committee, and uh, it does a nice job kind of laying out our role and our responsibilities to the community and uh, to the staff uh, and how this all works together. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'll be happy to report on, yeah, to Rachel and I will be happy to report on that the next time we meet. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Because I had looked at it, I was wondering um, if they were recording it, but I don't think they usually do. It would be best to get a, because of the hours that it's at, but if you guys could report on it, yeah, that would be terrific. Do that. Any other board comments? Okay, I want to apologize to our students in the audience for, we always have had um, an opportunity for the students to address the board. And through COVID, we just haven't had students attend. So if either one of you students would like to come and address the board, we would be happy to hear from you. Okay. Well, again, thank you. <laughs> thank you for attending the meeting. Um, Let's see, it's 8.17, so as promised, I will for, read for these emails for um, 10, 10 minutes till the end of our meeting, and then the rest of them will be posted um, on our website. And again, after this evening, we will, the, um, the community can feel free to always email the board if, if that's their, their desire. Um, but we will, as far as public comment, we will accept public comment live. Okay, so I'll start with this first one. And again, I am only reading an email that was sent to us. Good evening, board members. I hope your families are healthy and this message finds you well. I am unable to attend the meeting this evening, but I want the opportunity to share this message with you. It is time for our district to move towards a mass optional policy. Due to recent studies from established institutions such as Harvard and rulings that have come out of court, this is long overdue. It is a parent's prerogative if they want to send their child to school with a mask as much as it is for parents who do not wish to hide their child's face anymore. The fact is areas with masking mandates did not fare any better than those without them. Surrounding states such as New Jersey and Pennsylvania are already moving to a mask optional policy. I'm not sure if you're aware, but recently a group of fourth graders were taking a poll of their classmates on the playground in our district asking about vaccination status. If a child said they weren't vaccinated, the poll takers said they couldn't play with them. When I heard this, I was appalled, disappointed, and disgusted, to be honest. You find this acceptable. 
After the recent court ruling, I told my daughter she wouldn't have to wear a mask in school anymore. Tears of joy came to her eyes. As a parent, our children belong to us. We appreciated the board's position on trying to keep us safe, but the data doesn't support this action. A mask option policy needs to be implemented immediately. Large districts such as Shen have already moved to adopt this policy. It is time you do the same. You are elected by the community members and it's your duty to do what's right by them, by not only them, but our children. Their childhood, regardless of best efforts, are being stolen from them. Enough is enough. Thank you for your time. I look forward to the positive results this will bring. <coughs> Sincerely and respectfully, Ryan and Josie Watson. Do you want to set the next one? Oh, oh it won't be three. It won't be three minutes anyway. Hello, I am reaching out to the board today to support the proposal of a mask optional policy for our school district. Does anyone really believe making a mask made from Spider-Man fabric actually stops the spread of anything? Vaccines are available to almost all who want them. At this point in the pandemic, choices have been made and we need to move forward. If wearing a piece of fabric makes one feel comfortable, by all means wear it, but do not force others to join in the drink. Thank you, Debbie Eccles. Good evening. My name is Kristen Miller, and I have two children that attend Boresville Elementary. I am writing this email to request that the Board of Education adopt a mass optional policy. Parents should have the right to choose whether or not their child attends school mass. Let's face it. Much like other viruses that plague the world, COVID is here to stay. How long are we going to force our children to wear masks in school? Just the other night, my oldest daughter, who is in second grade, was reflecting on a recent experience with masks. She was sharing with us how she was talking with a friend of hers in the classroom, and they were joking around. Her friend was concerned for her and kept asking if she was okay and really joking around. My daughter said to me, Mom, if it wasn't wearing a mask, if I wasn't wearing a mask, she would have seen I was smiling and known right away that I was okay. She also reflected on the fact that everyone looks so different when they take the mask up at school for lunch and snack. This made her upset as her eyes filled with tears. How about the fact that her kindergarten teacher does not recognize her because that was pre-COVID when students were not wearing masks? Now that all the students are messed up, she is unrecognizable. This hurt her feelings. It's hard to understand how a mask can do such a thing. As you can clearly see, masks are negatively impacting our children, both socially and emotionally. Our own children know that this is not right, and they are counting on us to come together as a community to fix it. This should not be a government decision or decision made by the Department of Health. We know our children the best, and parents should have the right to choose what is right for their child as well as their family. Please consider making the current mask mandate optional and give each family the freedom of choice. Sincerely, Kristen Miller. Okay, next email. I want to reach out to the board to ask the Board of Education to determine a plan, next steps for getting the district back to normal which includes an open discussion with parents of children of the district before making a final determination. I believe a good first step in getting back to normal starts by allowing for a mass optional policy whereby parents decide what is best for the child. The intent of this is not for an argument as to whether or not they work. At this point, all parents have had the time and available research so they can make an informed decision as to whether or not a mask should be worn by the child. I've heard other states and even other school districts in New York talking about these plans, and I would like to know what boys will, will be preparing to do. Thanks. I appreciate the board's attention to this matter. Rihanna Camisa. Sorry if I touched the front first name. Okay, I think we have... She, she's oh, okay. She's so we have an email from Ms. Amanda Siena, who I believe already spoke. So 
No, I'm not. Just skip. No, we are good. Thank you. Okay, so I believe we have time for one more. And again, the board has was sent all of these emails and have reviewed them, and they will be posted. So I'll read. You want to put on the time one more time? Okay, thank you. To the Boardingsville Board of Education, I am writing to you today as I cannot attend the school board me meeting tonight. Thank you for taking the time to read my letter out loud. I have been at school board meetings previously before school started in hopes of finding a middle ground with the masking requirements as my daughter started kindergarten this year. Unfortunately, myself and other parents did not feel heard and understood that your hands felt tied as the governor imposed the mask mandate across New York State. Since then, we have been patient and silent. We followed the rules and we've attempted to adjust, especially my daughter. We've tried to look past the masking, but now that I continually have to, we tried to look past the masking, but now that I continually have to convince my kindergartner to go to school every morning, it breaks my heart to see her cry. She cannot speak for herself, so I am standing up and speaking for her. My heart breaks when my daughter tells me that she sits alone at lunch because her friends sit so far away from her. Or when she tells me she couldn't play with her friends and was stuck coloring instead. I know that her stories may not represent exactly what has happened as she is a five-year-old, but I would expect that kindergarten should be fun and I never imagined having to convince her to go to school until she was at least in third grade or higher. She constantly compares kindergarten with her previous preschool. She attended the same preschool from 2019 to 2021. She only had to wear a mask in the hallways and not in the classroom. And she asks now, mommy, why do I need to keep my mask on in the classroom? And it burns me to say that this is a new school with new rules. I am coming back today as the states around us are finally regaining their common sense. School districts are filing lawsuits against the state, and I wish our school would be one of them. To stand up and fight for their kids and make history instead of waiting for orders from the governor. I do understand that governors across the country threaten schools with, with pulling funding if schools don't follow their guidelines. If this is why your hands are tied, then I can assure you at least 50% of the parents in the school district will come together to help find other ways to fund the school. If we are this passionate to fight for our kids to breathe and see smiles, then please know we will work hard to gather the funding you need. Today, I ask that we take the first step forward to find a way to exit these restrictions as it's quite clear in recent events that this policy cannot stand forever, that we must all live with COVID here on out and, it, uh, and it's another risk to life we should not, should all adhere to. Okay, and then it's our three minute and our 828. Did you have, did you have a comment, Tim? No. I, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was talking no, with uh, Rachel over here. Okay, okay. We, we were just acknowledging that Frank is on top of the situation and that the board will come together and discuss things when Frank comes back to us. And exactly. We're just clarifying that. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I didn't sorry. know. I was, I was sorry. a little unclear as yeah. to what our response was to the people who came here tonight. Yeah. To say that we will be definitely discussing right. the option, I, I, well, policy option, when, mask option policy when, when, when we get the green light. Yep. As we do with everything. Yep. And, and, and that Frank is not only doing that, but he's talking to the Department of Health and all of the other in our medical director. organizations. In our medical yeah, director, our, yeah. The person every yeah. July first week. Right. Or, and like yeah. everything else, so, we we yeah will proceed as we always do. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Okay. So with that all said, can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll move it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And thank you.